Good evening, good Abend. Welcome to our next talk in our series, Economics Beyond the Swabian Hausfrau. This evening, we're very privileged and honored to have Emma Clancy, who is one of our favorite authors. She's worked six years at the EU Parliament and um, is extremely informed and extremely diligent in her research. And we asked her to join us tonight for a very simple reason. Dark clouds are gathering over Europe, very dark indeed. I'm not talking about the pandemic, I'm talking about the recession, the economic recession, which is actually already here, but thanks to mainstream media and the EU political class, we're told we're in the midst of a V recovery, but we aren't. And the situation is becoming increasingly dire day by day. If you just follow some of the news and the statistics, you'll, um, you'll be able to pick up on this on your own, but then that means ignoring a lot of the rubbish. I won't say much more. I am supposed to inform you that if you have questions, please use the chat button. And if you're, you're doing your question in German, it doesn't really matter because I'll translate them anyway, but there is a Dolmetscher button on your screen. So you can translate it from German into English. I'll say that once in German although I'm sure Leah has translated it already. Wenn Sie eine Frage haben, drücken Sie bitte einfach auf den Chat-Knopf unten. Und wenn Sie möchten, dass es übersetzt wird aus Deutsch ins Englisch, dann gibt es ein Dolmetsch oder Dolmetscher-Taste unten auch. Da können Sie auch drauf drücken. Once again, we'd very much like to thank Helle Panke Foundation and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation who make this or these talks possible. And just that you know, on the 6th of October will be the next talk and we're trying, we're going to have two people speaking on the topic of is stopping climate change and corporate profit compatible? And We've invited Hilary Wainwright, who I'm sure you know, or many of you do know, and then David White, who just wrote a brilliant book called Ecocide about corporations and climate change. That will be at the same time, 8 p.m. CET, and you're all invited. Once again, Emma, thank you very, very much that you've taken this time for us, and uh, see you later when you're finished. Okay, um, thanks very much for the invitation to you, Matthew, to Brave New Europe, to Helapanka and Rosa Luxemburg Foundations. Um, so the topic of tonight's talk will be uh, the, the question of public debt in the EC, sorry, the European Union. Um, it doesn't have to be a problem, but, uh, it, but it is because of the institutional setup. Um, so I'm going to start with a detailed picture of the main economic developments and forecasts in the EU and internationally. Uh, just tell me to slow down if I'm going too fast for the translator. Um, the first thing to notice is that we're not just on the road to, uh, you know, several years of recession and mass unemployment, we're on the road to extreme divergence. Um, the dynamics and vulnerabilities that caused divergence and inequalities were already well established before the pandemic, but these have been severely exacerbated by the impact of the coronavirus. So the economic shock caused by the pandemic has been extremely unequal, worsening inequalities between the global north and the global south, between the core and the periphery of the European Union, and its member states, and of course, uh, most severely between the rich and the poor within states. Uh, the 
Institute of International Finance estimates that more than 100 billion was withdrawn, 100 billion dollars um, was withdrawn from low and emerging economies, low income and uh, emerging economies between January and May, which led to severe currency depreciations and restricted the fiscal and policy space available to these countries. The collapse in oil prices and losses in tourism and trade have worsened the outlook in the global south and developing countries face an estimated two to three million dollar uh, payments shortfall between now and the end of 2021. Remittances have also been badly hit uh, before the outbreak of the virus. They made up around um, or more than 5% of GDP in 30 of the 59 economies classified as low income, so around half of the, of the poorest countries. Uh, then compounding these problems, the global recession will severely harm countries dependent on the informal economy, which makes up around one third of GDP and 70% of employment in developing and emerging economies. So the major international policy institutions all share the view that the, the fiscal space available to governments has determined the effectiveness of their response to the pandemic with massive implications, of course, for human health. So high levels of public debt in countries that have been forced to borrow in, in foreign currencies, such as the dollar, have, um, have played a significant role in restricting this policy autonomy. Half of the low income developing countries were experiencing uh, debt distress, public debt distress before the COVID-19 pandemic. And 64 countries were spending more on debt than public health at the start of the outbreak. Um, then you have, uh, you know, on the other hand, you have wealthy countries with resilient automatic stabilizers in the form of a strong welfare safety net. These countries were under less pressure when it came to um, discretionary public spending in response to the virus. The higher the credit default swap premium, the, the CDSs, which fueled the defaults during the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis by pushing up the bond spreads and the cost of borrowing. So the higher the, higher these um, credit default swap premium were, the, the smaller the size of the fiscal rescue package. Um, and lower credit ratings for countries also corresponded with a smaller fiscal response. Since the pandemic began, rating agencies have downgraded uh, several sovereigns also. Um, so these factors have uh, uh, resulted in a huge difference between the budgetary, budgetary response um, in, wealthy, in wealthy and developing countries. Uh, and by June, um, emerging economies uh, well, emerging and developing economies had spent an average 2.6% of GDP on emergency support measures, while the richest countries had spent an average of 10% on GDP. So there's a huge disparity there. Um, looking at the question of sovereign debt, this, uh, this issue threatened to tie the hands of the peripheral Eurozone governments at the start of the outbreak. Um, over the week of March 12th to the 18th, um, as bond yields spread, the cost of borrowing for Italy rose dangerously and it was, you know, it, it prompted the ECB's announcement of its pandemic emergency purchasing program, which I'm going to refer to as PEP in, in the future, um, calmed the sovereign bond markets and reduced the spreads. So the European Commission um, itself has acknowledged that government finances may be permanently weakened but it fails to acknowledge uh, yeah, that th this presents a unique problem in the Eurozone due to the no bailout clause in the treaty that prohibits direct monetary financing of government debt by the central bank. And of course, the stability and growth pact rules that impose a deflationary dynamic in a downturn. Um, so now I'll look at some of the underlying vulnerabilities in the global economy um, that existed before the outbreak. And these have also exacerbated uh, the pandemic related economic crisis. So in the high income economies, you had two related factors, the decades long declining rate, rate of profit and growing corporate debt. Um, and these two factors will significantly shape the recovery. 
we've seen company debt uh, over the recent decades has risen a lot faster than profits. Um, then in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the, the role and the power of the central banks has transformed and expanded dramatically, largely beyond the reach of democratic accountability. Um, we've had expansive and unconventionally, unconventional monetary policy from the Federal Reserve in the US, the ECB here in Europe and other central banks, um, particularly mass securities purchasing programs. Uh, which indicates that many central banks have now become the buyers of last resort in, in the financial markets, in addition to being the, the traditional you know, lender of, of last resort. So as QE, quantitative easing, as QE has flushed uh, the system, QE liquidity, the financial sphere has decoupled from the real economy. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they're entirely separate from each other, you could, you could say now. Um, and prior to the pandemic, the IMF identified financial risk taking by companies in the form of increased payouts and mergers and acquisitions, um, in contrast with subdued capital expenditures as a key vulnerability of the global economy. So these activities have clearly fueled extreme inequality. Uh, in the US, for example, the vast majority of equities are held by the top 10% wealthiest section of the population. These households be benefited most from the buoyant stock market, while falling house prices reduced the wealth of a large section of middle income households. And the Harvard Business Review has recently just reported that, and this is a quote, the consequence of substantial wealth losses at the bottom and in the middle of the distribution, coupled with wealth gains at the top, produced the lar largest spike in wealth inequality in post-war American history. This process has been replicated in Europe and elsewhere, although to a slightly lesser extent. So through QE, uh, new money created over the past decade by ostensibly public institutions, central banks, has flowed into the hands of the wealth, wealthiest few, rather than stimulate investment in the real economy. And corporations are loading up on uh, tax deductible debt supported by central bank purchases and they're using it to directly fund record high shareholder distribution through stock buybacks and dividends pr primarily. So senior corporate executives and hedge fund and investment bank managers whose remuneration mainly comes from stock options um, have used open market repurchases to manipulate their company's stock prices to their own benefit and that of others who are in the business of timing the buying and selling of publicly listed shares. So in 2018 alone, the US S&P 500 companies carried out about $806 billion in buybacks, around 30% of which were funded through debt. And dividend payouts are more common in EU companies, um, but they are also now increasingly using share buybacks. And research has also shown that uh, EU companies distribute just as much cash to uh, shareholders as US companies do. So corporate debt has surged as credit to the non-financial sector rose from around 120% of global GDP prior to the 2008 crash to 144% at the end of 2019. And as the profitability of the non-financial corporate sector has declined over many decades with a temporary neoliberal revival during the 1980s and 90s, uh, companies have turned to debt and use it to fund mergers and speculation in the financial sector instead of in production and prior to the coronavirus outbreak the outstanding amount of corporate bonds reached 16 trillion dollars us dollars and um, and the corporate debt has not only uh, hugely risen but it's also significantly deteriorated in quality uh, leveraged finance, which is originated by banks and now increasingly by shadow banks, um, facilitates borrowing by companies with high levels of debt and low credit ratings. Leveraged loans have now been used, um, well, they're increasingly being used in the corporate sector to fund mega mergers and leveraged buyouts. So they're contributing to the concentration and, and monopolization. 
um, that we see taking place. Uh, a vast market for this low rated corporate debt um, has sprung up. It's the, the debt is securitized through collateralized loan obligations or CLOs. And these instruments very closely resemble the collateralized debt obligations, CDOs of the global financial crisis. And you know, institutions like the Financial Stability Board um, and other global institutions have issued warnings prior to the pandemic breaking out about the shaky foundations of this market, which is um, the CLO market is estimated at um, up, to up to three trillion US dollars. The increasing opacity of the CLOs in the shadow banking sector and its vulnerability to shocks. Um, by the end of May, one of the major credit rating agencies had downgraded the ratings of 1800 companies, affecting more than one third of global rated non-financial corporate debt. So, I mean, the corporate debt market presents a serious threat to financial stability in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and its related economic crash. We've had a health crash, we're having, a, we've had an economic crash, but we may uh, in the near future experience a financial crash or financial shock. Um, so in the EU, high corporate debt and the declining rate of profit are major pre-existing factors also, not just globally. Um, and the, you know, the EU is still more than any other area trying to overcome the legacy of the global financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. The Euro area member states are also affected by a high level of non-performing loans and chronic low growth in the peripheral economies arising from the structure and rules of the monetary union, which I'll go into in a moment. The Euro area banks have also suffered from chronic low profitability um, so going on to Europe's economic outlook, uh, as I said, the crisis in the EU is aggravated by the architecture of the monetary union and the EU itself, which benefits the exporters and penalizes the non-core member states. And I'm sure this is a, you know, an issue that you're all familiar with, but um, it's worth just going through some of the basics. So the Euro area lacks a formal lender of last resort Although the ECB has acted as a de facto lender of last resort for the for the whole banking system of the euro area since October 2008. But both ECB liquidity and EU fiscal support for member states in need have only ever been provided conditionally with harsh IMF style fiscal tightening and structural reform requirements. So the European Commission made pretty bleak uh, projections for economic output in its spring forecast, but even these were revised downwards in its interim summer forecast. They were, you know, they became a lot worse. The sharpest contraction in pain since the Second World War meant that you fell into a recession, obviously, in the first 2020. In the first quarter, uh, GDP contracted by 3.2% in the EU, and 3.6% in the Euro area. And in the second quarter, EU GDP fell by 13.5% in comparison to the previous quarter. During the generalized lockdown that we had uh, in the second quarter, the economy operated around um, at around 25 to 30% below capacity. And the commission has, you know, and, and others have noted the, that even though the, you know, the, the economic disruption was broad-based, and um, the impact was highly asymmetrical across countries. So in spring, the commission noted that, well, a forecast that the contraction would be around 10% in, uh, of GDP in the worst affected countries in 2020, but this too has now been revised downwards to around 12% um, for states like Spain in a baseline scenario and more than 15%, uh, more than a 15% decline in a severe scenario. Um, even factoring in the announced supportive fiscal and monetary policies, the commission estimates that economic uh, output will contract by around 8.75% year on year in the Euro area in 2020. 
but these estimates, these estimates were based on the presumption that the containment measures would be steadily relaxed throughout the second half of the year. The euro area is expected to recover to an annual GDP growth rate of 6% in 2021, which would mean that output at the end of 2021 is still 2% lower than in 2019. Um, in July, the Eurostat forecast uh, that euro, in, euro area inflation would be 0.4% in 2020, but its flash estimate in August downgraded this significantly with annual inflation in 2020 now lowered to, zero, to negative 0.2%. And again, I have to reiterate that uh, new outbreaks, localized lockdowns and extended containment measures will affect these estimates, obviously, even in the absence of a, a new generalized lockdown. But with the current health situation uh, deteriorating um, significantly over the past few weeks across a number of EU member states, it's increasingly likely that the indicators will be somewhere between the baseline and the severe scenario. So I want to look now at the divergent response among the uh, member states, uh, which of course leads to divergent outcomes. The, the peripheral countries have been severely penalized by the architecture of the monetary union and the EU's policy choices made in response to the 2008 crisis. Uh, and it's now, you know, proved beyond, beyond doubt that the southern member states public debt level was increased rather than reduced as a result of the austerity imposed by the EU and the member states governments. So there's been a widely divergent response to the pandemic among the different EU states, depending on their GDP size, their public debt levels and the abil their, ability, their ability to borrow cheaply on the market. Um, the economic situation at the onset of the pandemic, uh, largely the, the economic situation that they were experiencing, you know, as an individual state, largely determined their fiscal response. And this in turn will have a lasting impact on the nature of the recovery in each state. Obviously, the more states are able to spend now, for example, on healthcare and on preserving jobs, the faster their recovery will be. So while you guys in Germany would obviously know better uh, than me, but uh, while the German government's coronavirus response package isn't perfect, its size and its impact dwarfs those of other states. Um, and you know, the, the position that Germany experiences within the EU has allowed it to respond far more powerfully um, than its neighbors. So an analysis of the budgetary measures that were taken by June, by June within the EU shows that Germany was able to provide around 150 billion euros in expenditure based, based on immediate spending to respond to the health crisis, provide grants to SMEs and self-employed people and provide social assistance. And in addition to that 150 billion euros, it also provided more than 1 trillion euros in liquidity and loan guarantees. So France, by comparison, has injected 67, 67 uh, billion in immediate spending, as well as 300 billion of loan guarantees. So that's just one, yeah, one, one comparison, but there's, there's a huge divergence. Obviously, there are other factors um, that will shape the recovery also. But, you know, the fact is that Italy, Spain, France, Portugal, and particularly Greece, and a number of other countries just do not have the, the financial capacity, the fiscal capacity to respond in the same way. So the debt overhang from the Euro crisis has directly impacted on the ability of member states to respond to the pandemic effectively. Um, I just wanna look, uh, and the translator doesn't ha have this, but I just wanna very briefly look at the forecast. These are commission forecast unemployment figures. Um, I'm only going to compare Germany and Italy. Um, so in the baseline scenario, in, 20, in 2022, unemployment will be 4.3% in Germany. Oh, sorry, no, I'm looking at Spain. So 4.3% in Germany and 17.4% in Spain at the end of 2022. And if you go to the Commission's severe scenario, 
the uh, German unemployment rate will be 5.9% and in Spain it will be 22.2%. This is at the end of 2022, so years to come. So that's just one uh, example of the, you know, the divergent um, outcomes we're already seeing forecast. So over the past month, politically, um, the southern states have asked for solidarity in the form of corona bonds and perpetual debt and had the door slammed in their faces by the leaders of the northern states. So this response coming after the Troika interventions in these countries and a decade of austerity has dramatically weakened public support for the EU, particularly in Italy. And you can see the far right is winning new supporters every day. The average public debt to GDP ratio was 65% in 2007. And remember that the Stability and Growth Pact states that it must be kept below 60% of GDP. But in late 2019, the average public debt to GDP ratio was 86.1% in the Eurozone. For the countries most affected by the sovereign debt crisis in 2010 to 2012, the debt level in 2019 was far higher. So it was almost 180% for Greece, 130% for Italy, 120% for Portugal, 100% for France, and 98% for Spain. Uh, Germany's debt level for the same period was 62.6% of GDP, but you already have this process of, you know, quite severe divergence when it comes to public debt levels. And, you know, despite, um, despite the fact that some of them are three times, you know, the limit of 60%, um, there's just, a, there's been a total refusal by the EU institutions to actually acknowledge um, that, yeah, to, to acknowledge this reality and they keep insisting that no, it'll be, um, it needs to remain at 60%. So let's also remember that the level of public debt in the EU was not caused by reckless government spending as the narrative goes, but rather by the socialization of private debt through the rescue of the financial sector and the dramatic increases in the cost of borrowing due to market discipline, so-called market discipline, linked to the ECB's failure to intervene. And the, the impact of the austerity programs imposed by the Troika not only limited growth, but also devastated the public services, including healthcare. So um, in its May financial stability review, the ECB predicted that public debt will re reach 200% of GDP in Greece uh, in this year, 160% uh, in Italy, 130% in Portugal, and 120% in France and Spain. And on average, Eurozone debt will rise from uh, 2019 uh, level of 86% of GDP to above 100% on average while average fiscal deficits will be around 8% of GDP. So several, uh, several member states, including Italy, Spain, France, and Portugal, um, all have to refinance large, large proportions of their debt within the next year. So the ECB in, in this review, it's, made, uh, it's financial stability review, it warned that the associated the increase in public debt levels could also tr trigger a reassessment of sovereign risk by market participants and reignite more pressure um, on, on the vulnerable sovereigns. So public debt does not need to be such a major problem in the EU. Uh, it has been used as a weapon against the member states of the EU over the past decade in a similar way as it's been used by, say, the IMF against the countries of the Global South for decades, demanding the imposition of structural adjustment programs in all but name. So the EU has used debt as an instrument to transfer wealth from the public to the private sector and from the poor to the rich, from labour to capital, while also using it to intervene in public policy areas that it, does, it has no legal authority over. So, for example, um, the Commission had used the Stability and Growth Pact 
procedures at the European semester to order member states to cut spending on or privatize healthcare services on 63 different occasions between 2011 and 2018. Uh, states were told to raise the pension age or cut funding to pensions 105 times over the same period. So the, the, the Commission has no actual authority over the um, provision of healthcare and the pension systems, but it's using the, the debt um, issue as a weapon in order to enforce its austerity agenda. Not that, you know, there, <laughs> there are plenty of uh, member state governments who are more than willing to go along with that agenda. Um, so the prospect of massive spending that, that's, you know, obviously required now and in the future being added to the balance sheets of member states' public debt presents unique problems in the EU. Um, and while countries around the world are monetizing their debt through their central banks, the EU has tied its own hands behind its back uh, by enshrining monetarism and austerity into its treaty. So we remain stuck in the 1990s while the rest of the world, or at least the high income countries, have moved on. The design of the Eurozone also contributes to debt crises. Um, while the, the debt and deficit rules enshrined in the Stability and Growth Act enforce anti-worker and anti-growth policies. So the, you know, these issues, they, they need, we need a, a change in the treaty at the very least um, to actually resolve them. For members of the single market with an export-oriented economy, such as Germany and the Netherlands, the EU provides a major free trade zone for its products. Uh, and this setup has allowed Germany to build up a massive trade surplus, under which it exports around 300 billion more than it imports each year. But for every surplus, there has to be an equal deficit. Um, and around two thirds of Germany's surplus is generated by intra -EU, EU trade, which saps demand from the economies of the other EU member states. Uh, and it forces many of them to run significant trade deficits. And if foreign direct investment is not forthcoming to finance these deficits, then the member states need to borrow. That's the only option that they have. So that's the way that the, the actual setup of the Eurozone um, yeah, contributes to uh, to debt, it's, it's prone to debt crises. But due to the harsh fiscal austerity applied after the recession, there is now not even enough internal demand uh, in the Eurozone to sustain the German industry. So even before the coronavirus pandemic hit, uh, a global slowdown was unfolding in Germany and with it the Eurozone was on the verge of another recession, uh, exposing the dangers of this economic mo model and I'm sure uh, you who have tuned in from Germany also know that this, you know, this economic model is based on uh, making workers more pre precarious, making jobs more precarious and impoverishing workers. Um, so when it comes to the EU's recovery plan, uh, I would characterize it by with two words, um, inadequacy and inequality. So at first we saw Earlier this year, uh, we saw member states competing against each other for medical supplies and then wrangling over who foot the bill for the rescue package and only belatedly adopting a set of insufficient economic measures to address the emergency. So the first response package in April supposedly consisted of 540 billion. Um, and bear with me, I'm going to go through the numbers because you know, somebody has to, and the, the commission is, is uh, notorious for, um, you know, uh, basically lying about, <laughs> about the amount of money that it's spending. So this, this package in April supposedly consisted of 540 billion, which included 100 billion in loans for short-time work, work schemes, 240 billion in potential loans, from the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, which is the bailout fund. Uh, this has so far been left untouched because it's politically toxic due to its association in the minds of the public with the hated Troika. And the last component of this first package consists of 200 billion euros 
in Euro European investment bank loans to SMEs. But the Commission is basing this figure on leveraging uh, a sum of 25 billion to mobilize private capital to make up the remainder. So in reality, uh, the Commission says this is a 540 billion package, but it, yeah, um, it really just consists of 100 billion in loans that will actually be dispersed for the short time work schemes and 25 billion of additional funding for the EIB. Um, and anyone who's in any way familiar with the um, with the EU institutions knows that this is a very common uh, a common trick that they that they use and they have for a long time. So the Eurogroup meeting in April that decided this package also killed the Corona bond proposal. This proposal was made by the leaders of nine member states: France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland. Greece, Luxembourg, Slovenia, and Belgium the previous month. Uh, and the, the, the argument was the proposal was supported by the ECB. So Eurobonds have long been proposed as a solution to Euro, Eurozone divergence, but they were shut down by Northern states during the sovereign debt crisis. The basic concept of a Eurobond or in the case of financing the recovery from the pandemic, a corona bond, is that an EU or Eurozone instrument would be used to pool the issuing of government debt by the members of the common currency. All of the debt would then be rated equally by credit ratings agencies and investors and would be kept off the member states' national accounts. So in short, uh, a well-designed corona bond would allow Eurozone governments to spend in response to the health and economic crisis in a way that doesn't add to their national debt burden and keeps uh, borrowing costs relatively low. But the outcome of the April Eurogroup meeting uh, effectively took Corona bonds of this form off the table. So the council agreed in July to establish an economic recovery fund linked to the long-term EU budget. The, which is called the Multi-Annual Financial Framework. I'm going to refer to it from now as the MFF. So that's the, the long-term EU budget. Uh, EU leaders agreed on uh, 750 billion euro um, recovery effort and on a 1.07 billion long-term EU budget. So from 2021 to 2027. The centerpiece, uh, of, the, of the package is the Recovery and Resilience Facility of 672 billion euros, uh, including 360 billion euros in loans and 312 billion euros in grants, with the remainder of the, that money um, topping up some of the EU's existing budget programs. So in total, you know, there was a big debate around the proportion that would be loans and the proportion that would be grants. Um, but in total, 390 billion euros of the package will be grants, or this, this is an equivalent of 0.7% of EU GDP each year over three years. So it's, it's absolutely tiny um, when you look at what's actually required. So the Commission proposes to temporarily lift the ceiling on the EU's own resources um, in order to borrow this 750 billion euros on the financial markets uh, to be spent during the period, yeah, uh, during the next um, several years. The bonds will be repaid after 2027 and before 2058, and they have varying, varying maturities. But one of the main points I want to make is that the Inclusion of the MFF in the Commission and Council's recovery package is a sleight of hand. It's a, it's a trick um, because by linking the recovery fund and the budget, the Commission is attempting to disguise the inadequacy of both. Not only is the amount proposed by EU leaders totally insufficient, um, you know, as I said, much of it will come in the form of loans instead of grants, but even the so-called grants will need to be repaid in future through the EU budget without, you know, if we don't have the introduction of new own resources, new, new tax revenue. 
So the recovery fund is not, in my opinion, a true instrument of solidarity because a well-designed common bond, one based on solidarity, would be open-ended and allocated on the base of economic need. This one is allocating a predetermined amount to each state, which needs to be repaid within a defined time frame. So the loans are loans, but the grants are loans too. Then under the next generation plan, which is what I'm referring to, the Commission's 750 billion um, uh, debt uh, funds that it will borrow, um, th this debt will be repaid using three possible options with the Commission President saying that her preference is for the EU to raise new own resources in future, such as a digital tax, a carbon border adjustment tax, the expansion of the emissions trading scheme and a tax on large multinationals. The other two options are to pay the money back through future EU budgets until 2058, either through increased member state contributions or through reduced programs. But uh, so obviously, um, you know, raising new own resources would be preferable, but it will be very difficult without changing the treaty of the EU, which requires unanimous voting on taxation issues in the council. So corporate tax proposals always stumble in the council due to the opposition of a cabal of the EU's uh, tax haven member states, which includes the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland, Belgium, Hungary, Malta and Cyprus. Any one of them can veto any tax proposal, well, any member state can. So proposals for a financial transaction tax, a common consolidated corporate tax base, and a turnover tax on digital companies have all been defeated or blocked in the council. And media reports are now suggesting that the planned car carbon border adjustment tax, which is basically a tariff on uh, you know, goods being imported into the EU, which have, um, have a high carbon footprint. The, yeah, the media is now suggesting that this, um, the commission officials have told them that this will never see the light of day so another big problem with the recovery fund, the recovery facility, is that there will be strings attached, as always, in the EU. Uh, and these will be embedded in the European semester, the EU's framework for surveilling and controlling member states' national budgets. Um, according to the plan, member states will design their own tailored national recovery plans based on the investments and reform priorities identified as part of the European semester. But uh, a study that we, we did in this office um, earlier this year uh, found, we, we surveyed the reforms that, that were um, pushed by the Commission through the European semester process, as I mentioned earlier, from, the two, from 2011 to 2018. And uh, this identified increasing the pension age, cutting funding to health, restricting wage growth and reducing job security, and cutting wealth, welfare supports to be among the most, uh, to, well, to be the most common priorities um, of, of the Commission, of the European semester. So the Commission President has, um, in, in her speech when she was making this proposal in June, she said that in sum, this would bring our recovery effort to a total of 2.4 trillion euros. And even the European Parliament, which is usually on board with massaging the numbers through this leveraging trick, um, actually, you know, warned her uh, against the use of, and this is a quote, against the use of financial wizardry and dubious multipliers to advertise ambitious figures in its response to the pandemic because the EU's credibility was at stake. So if we remove all the spin, the amount of real new funds from the EU for this recovery is 310 billion euros or 390 if you include the top ups to the, um, to the budget. That's the only immediate kind of grants that will be um, made. So it, it's not an insignificant sum and it's been welcomed by countries such as Italy and Spain, but it is nowhere near the 2.4 trillion euros um, touted by Ursula von der Leyen in her speech and it's nowhere near sufficient to actually deal with the problem. 
according to a note that the ECB released today, the grants aspect of the recovery fund will only reach over 0.5% of Eurozone GDP in 2022 and 2023 out of the five years in which it will have an impact. For uh, Spain, the grants will amount to about 3.4% of GDP, but if you, that needs to be broken down over several years, that's, that's in total. Um, and Italy will, will gain 1.9% of its GDP. So again, when we're talking about uh, GDP collapses in 2020 of you know, uh, 12 to 15% um, this year alone, that's, it's not a large sum. So I wanna look at the, the commission's proposed MFF as well. Um, again, I'm sorry to bore you with the numbers, but uh, it's, it's another area where um, the, the spin just needs to be kind of dismantled um, uh, step by step. <laughs> so the commission has uh, proposed in this package an MFF um, of uh, 1.07 billion, billion euros. Obviously, this is the, the normal budget, so it shouldn't be included in the when we're measuring the specific responses to coronavirus at all. But in any case, this figure is even lower than the Commission's 2018 legislative proposal for the budget that, um, that will run from 2021 to 2027. The EU's budget, for those who want to wear, consists almost entirely of contributions from member states based on their GNI, their gross national income. So the long-term budget, this, the MFF, has been steadily declining as a percentage of GNI-based contributions since 1995. The three institutions in the EU, the Parliament, the Commission and the Council, have been arguing fiercely over the size and the content of the next MFF since the proposal was made in 2018. So for comparison, the MFF operating from uh, 2014 until 2020, the one that's currently operating, was set at 1.03% of EU28 GNI. But with Brexit, obviously, you take out um, the British contribution and that sum rises to 1.16% of the EU27 GNI. Uh, so the Commission's 2018 proposal was for 1.11% of EU27 GNI, which would be a sum of around 1.135 trillion. And the parliament obviously wants, you know, the, par the parliament wants more. Um, I have a lot of complaints and a lot of uh, negative things to say about the European parliament, but it's actually been quite strong on at least demanding, you know, a bit more for uh, cohesion funds. And let's remember that within this, uh, you know, currency union, um, the EU budget, which is usually, yeah, just over 1% of, G, of um, GNI, is basically, you know, the, it's, the main, uh, it's the main kind of convergence tool that um, the EU can use to transfer uh, fiscal resources to the countries who need it most. So, I'll, uh, in addition to um, the, the MFF that's on, on the table being uh, lower. Um, it's also, uh, its content is also a problem because it aims to um, increase expenditure on security and defense and you know, border security, so-called border security, with severe cuts to spending on cohesion in comparison to the current MFF. So cuts like this will be devastating to many, e even without the coronavirus, cuts of this magnitude would be devastating to the, uh, countries like Portugal, for example. 80% um, of public investment in Portugal is uh, entirely com comes entirely from EU cohesion funds. So the council agreement on 1.07 billion MFF over the next seven, um, seven years as part of this recovery package is ever so slightly higher than what was previously on the table, but it still represents a retreat from the Commission's original proposal in 2018. Um, and her plan uh, involves using some of the funds 
forward by the Commission uh, under the um, Next Generation Recovery Fund to reinforce certain budget programs. So they're taking with one hand and, you know, top, topping it up a little with another. It'll help restore some of the resources, but the final outcome actually still represents a cut to the level, the existing level of funding in terms of EU budget programs. Uh, the the so-called frugal four countries in the council managed to retain and even enlarge the budget rebates that they receive. Um, and also to ensure that members of the council can, so member states um, as part of the council can object to dispersals of the recovery funds in other states based on the policy choices that those states are making. Uh, the parliament now has the opportunity to insist on some improvements to this plan because it actually has a bit of power over the, MF, the MFF. Um, it only has the power to approve it or reject it, but um, I mean, yeah, they're, they're kind of holding out for a slightly better, uh, better outcome. So to summarize with regard to the EU response to the coronavirus crash, Southern states have been disadvantaged and penalized by the Eurozone structure and by the austerity agenda. This added to their public debt and weakened their capacity to respond effectively to the, um, to the global financial crisis, oh, sorry, to the current crisis. Um, then the divergence in response between member states has in turn uh, shaped the nature um, and length of the recovery. And finally, the longer and deeper the recession, the higher the level of public debt that these states will emerge with. So as I said at the beginning, we are on the path to extreme divergence uh, and the EU's recovery plan is nowhere near uh, what is needed to prevent this. So in terms of, uh, you know, policy among th those of us uh, working here in, in the left in the European Parliament, and um, some of the kind of immediate demands that we're putting forward are uh, that, I mean, the debt and deficit rules of the Stability and Growth Pact are now irreversibly detached from economic reality. We think the pact should be scrapped for good. And um, the size of the recovery fund, uh, the, the common debt that's issued by the Commission should be doubled to 1.5 trillion, um, as was proposed by, by the Spanish government and the council. The ECB has actually this week suggested that this recovery facility be made permanent, you know, even though it has a lot of limitations, that would be, you know, that would be something. Um, the dispersal of the, the recovery funds should be completely separated from the European semester process. Um, so they should be, you know, it should be unconditional. Well, unconditional in terms of macroeconomics, but it should be, uh, you know, dependent on a, a commitment to upholding fundamental rights. And then the dispersal of funds from governments um, or, the, or from the EU budget should be conditional on commitments by firms to comply with the Paris Agreement, to retain their workforce and comply with high labour and governance standards and of course, to ban uh, stock buybacks and dividends um, to shareholders. The, the MFF should be restored to at least the level of the Commission's original 2018 proposal um, and the rebate system abolished. Then the funding for climate, the justice transition, at, uh, the just transition and cohesion policy uh, don't just need to be restored, but obviously significantly increased. Um, and the, the EU treaty should be changed, obviously, in a, in a number of ways, um, or gotten rid of completely. But, you know, this specific demand is for uh, the treaty to be changed to remove the unanimity require, requirement in the Council on voting on taxation matters, um, to stop the tax havens from having a veto. Um, but now, before I finish, I'm going to talk about a bit about the, the role of the ECB. So the EU treaty and the mandate of the ECB make public debt uniquely problematic, as I've said, but it doesn't have to be this way. Public debt doesn't have to be a problem for government so long as the state is, the state is able to continue to service its debts. The evidence shows that the corona related public debt can be monetized by the ECB with no corresponding rise in inflation. 
the usual arguments against this solution are losing steam and mainstream economists are making this point, but it seems to yet, you know, be yet to pierce through the, the, the group think of the European institutions. The simplest way to fund the necessary ongoing public spending of the member states is for the ECB to credit the national accounts of the member states. Um, but, you know, uh, at the moment, this is obviously off the table because of the uh, legal prohibition on direct monetary financing. But until that happens, um, there are other decisions that can be taken in the meantime, uh, such as the um, the proposal from the Spanish government uh, to have, it, it's similar to what's been agreed with Next Generation, but the Spanish proposal was for the issuance of perpetual debt by the commission of 1.5 trillion. And um, so the, the, the member states would only be required to pay, to repay the, the interest on the debt and not the, um, not the principal. The ECB could purchase the debt issued by the commission under next generation on the secondary market and hold it in perpetuity. And um, it could continue to use the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program, to purchase government bonds of member states without its self-imposed restrictions on the issuer um, uh, share and capital key and proceed to agreements for debt cancellation with these states. Earlier this week, uh, two members of the European, uh, sorry, of the, of the ECB's Governing Council anonymously briefed the Financial Times uh, saying that the bank was reviewing the PEP program in terms of when to phase it out, but that they were considering applying the flexibility of the PEP, the PEP program when it comes to um, the capital key and the member state share. It was considering applying that to its other existing asset purchasing programs. So there will be a huge battle um, within, I mean, the ECB is already clearly at war with itself. Uh, but um, yeah, there'll be, there'll be a big battle about that. And obviously you all would be aware of the, um, the, the, the legal challenges to PEP and, or sorry, to the PSPP and the, um, and PEP by, people like the RFD. So it's beyond the scope of this talk to go into all of the major debates taking place across the world now when it comes to central banking and monetary policy. But it is very clear that the old ways of forecasting inflation are dead. The question uh, that sh should inflation even be the policy target is now being asked with alternative indicators, including employment and GDP being proposed. And most significantly, in my opinion, um, the MMT framework of looking at government budgets and financing defi deficit spending has reached the mainstream and is now proposed by many on the left and center left, including people like Peter Boffinger. Um, and it has pr particular significance in my view in relation to the Green New Deal and job guarantee proposals. So to finish up, um, I want to highlight what I think will be the key ideological and political fights that we face in the coming years beyond, um, you know, beyond just the EU. And I think the Bank for International Settlements put it very well, you know, as a representative of the capitalist class uh, in its annual economic report in June. Uh, on public debt, it says, Governments must stand ready to take corrective action to ensure a path of primary fiscal balances consistent with fiscal sustainability. Lifting and sustaining higher economic growth is paramount. This puts the onus on growth friendly fiscal policies as well as structural reforms. Then on the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy, it says direct and overt deficit financing should be avoided. A key risk is fiscal dominance. And it warns of a possible future scenario if the pandemic is longer lasting than expected. It warns of a world uh, in which the public sector's grip on the economy is much greater. Our globalization would be forced into a major retreat. And this would be a world in which uh, labor and firms would gain much more price pricing power and the independence, the so-called independence of central banks would be threatened. 
But of course, it's clear that central banks today are not remotely independent. They're just isolated, in, uh, sorry, insulated from democracy. So the, the ruling elite wants to return to the pre-pandemic world. It's, it's divided by about its approach to the so-called zombie firms. Should the state intervene and restructure private debt? If it does, should the government hold equity in the firms that it rescues, or should the zombies be let to die uh, indiscriminately? So all of the uh, indicators are that the economic recovery will be planned through public sector intervention in the corporate sector and through the growing influence of central banks. But the question is, in whose interest will it be planned? And I think that is our, our general challenge to to direct these uh, interventions into a focus on the climate transition, obviously, and uh, people's well-being. So I'll finish up there and we'll go to discussion. Thanks very much for, for attending the talk. Thank you very much, Emma. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, Look, we had one question very early on. Someone noticed that you had sheets of paper in front of you. And the information was very dense. And they asked, is there somewhere they can uh, read about this? And you mentioned you are preparing a paper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, this, I'm basically reading out, I, I wrote the speaking notes so the translator um, wouldn't have to <laughs> do it on the fly. Um, but it's, it's all, all of this information is out of a, a forthcoming report that, um, I'm publishing in the uh, office of Martin Schurdelan, the d Linker MEP. So we are publishing it in English and in German in, German in, the, um, in the next two to three weeks. So I'll be sure to uh, send that to Matthew and you can put it on the Brave New Europe uh, website or yeah, uh, something like that. Um, but absolutely, the, it's, uh, it will definitely be publishing this information. Good. So the first question is from Michel. What about the poor, and, uh, quotation marks, EU member states like Romania or Bulgaria? Are there plans of the institutions for the future to, again, in quotation marks, let them starve? Harsh words, but all countries are focused on their own interests and budgets. Is COVID-19 a turning point for the future of the EU and solidarity? Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I've got the question here as well. So, oh, you see them, good. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the it's funny because the, well, it's interesting because um, the a lot of the member states in the East have not been, um, they, they've actually managed the lockdowns a lot better and um, weren't originally as exposed to coronavirus. So, and they, um, they don't have such a huge proportion of their economies being dependent on tourism um, as countries like Spain and Italy do. Uh, so those countries are, um, they will actually significantly uh, receive, um, you know, they'll, they will receive a net benefit from this um, package. So those, uh, if you go to the ECB's website, the statement that they published today has a, an analysis of how much, um, what the fiscal impact of these countries, of, of the recovery grants will be on each member state. And um, yes, th those countries, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, will be um, net beneficiaries. And I think Slovakia will be one of the big beneficiaries up there with the likes of Portugal. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, the they, they will benefit from this, but um, I have to say from the, the study that I was referring to in the speech about what the commission is directing member states to do. And um, it was very, very clear that in all of the Eastern uh, states, the, the top priority of the, um, of the commission was to finish off the privatization, the total privatization of state owned enterprises in these countries. Um, and to uh, implement measures that would restrict wage growth. So to, uh, to reduce the bargaining power of workers um, in these countries. So the kind of, again, giving with one hand, but, but pushing down um, with the other. 
uh, and uh, is COVID-19 a turning point for the future of the EU and solidarity? Um, I mean, I think it actually has potential as, as a moment in terms of, you know, the council actually agreeing to um, the next generation uh, fund to, to borrow collectively. Um, as I said, it's, uh, it, it will depend on the future battles. I mean, you can see the battles happening now over um, the nature, the size, the, the temporariness of this um, mechanism. And it's only been achieved with the pr promise that it is temporary um, and, and all of these measures will be, uh, you know, gone and it will revert back to normal in the future. Um, but obviously politics can change. So it, it's, it is an important step, but um, it was really uh, incredibly overhyped um, in the media with the, you know, the uh, description of this as a Hamilton moment for Europe. Um, yeah, I think it was, it was overhyped, but it's, it's significant nonetheless. All right, the next question, uh, you can see it as well as I can, but I shall read it out. Can I ask you to speculate further on the anticipated future financial shock you referred to in the 20th minute into your talk, please? Speculate on how this will occur and the likely consequences. Okay, um, well, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Like the, in terms of what I've read about um, the, the, the problems of corporate debt, um, I think Steve Keen is one of the per people who's written um, the, you know, the best material and information on this. So the corporate debt is high, obviously, um, at, at record high levels. Uh, and um, it's being traded in the same way as the, as the subprime mortgages were being traded on um, and speculated on in, in the lead up to the global financial crisis. This was before the pandemic. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, it, it partly depends on how, you know, how exposed each uh, region or country's bank is to um, the corporate sector. You also have the, uh, you know, the huge kind of um, rise of shadow banking, which is totally opaque and unregulated. Uh, the EU has been pushing these um, you know, these phenomena through, it's trying to build up the capital markets union, which is a very loose and vague kind of term for deregulating um, the financial markets and trying to emulate, trying to draw uh, in investment um, in, into Euro, in, into the Euro. So it's actually like a geopolitical project where they're trying to make the Euro um, more attractive uh, to to uh, rival the dollar, um, but yeah, it, it will depend on you know the say for example you have this the wave of defaults and bankruptcies and um, begins in earnest, then you have you have automatically corporate bankruptcies, um, so they can't repay the debt to the banks or the shadow banks that they've um, borrowed it from. Then you have uh, you, yeah, it depends on how far that spreads and how much public support there is. So you have people like Mario Draghi saying that there has to be um, a restructure of private debt, and he's talking about the corporate sector. Um, so it, it, it will depend entirely on whether the state will intervene or not and, you know, uh, rescue these so-called uh, zombie companies. Um, but I think, yeah, I think the... Um, the impact that this ha will have on the banks and the financial institutions will there, there's been a, you know, a number of regulations put in place since the global financial crisis, but they never, um, they never broke up the too big to fail banks. They never, uh, you know, put a firewall between um, commercial banking and investment banking. So the, the key reforms that were demanded by the left and by people who um, prioritized financial safety, uh, were never actually implemented in the wake of the, um, in Europe anyway, in the wake of the, the global financial crisis. So I think that Europe's banks are, particularly because of their low rate of profitability also, um, it means they have a very small buffer uh, to, to, to cope with. So 
um, yeah, it absolutely all depends on the, uh, the role that governments play in either restructuring this debt and taking it into the public sector or, you know, allowing these companies to fall and allowing the, um, the corporate debt uh, exposure of the banks to, to spread. All right, the next question, I'll just read it again. What can grassroots movements in Europe do to help ensure that the economic solutions to the crises will be planned in the interests of European workers? From the US and Southern Europe, I hear a lot of calls for a rent strike organized on payment of housing rent. Could that be a mechanism to force governments into more generous relief packages if the strike gets big enough? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, a rent strike is um, popular in a, in a number of countries. Um, in, in the US and in Europe and in other countries. So I think the question of um, household debt is going to be really, it's going to play a huge role in the coming years because it's not only corporations that are going to require, you know, restructuring. Um, the yeah, ordinary households are going to um, suffer in terms of uh, evictions, in terms of repossessions, um, foreclosures, in, and in terms of uh, being pursued aggressively by debt collectors. So um, yeah, debt will absolutely play a huge role uh, in, in the coming years. And I think that um, we need to strategize now about um, not only a rent strike, but also uh, putting putting in place, um, you know, restricting the rights of d demanding that the um, that the debt collectors uh, are restricted, um, demanding that the vulture funds can't come in and purchase people's homes from the banks and then aggressively um, evict them, you know, with no kind of state regulation. Uh, I think, it, yeah, these kind of actions could absolutely um, be the be the decisive factor as to whether the government actually provides relief to working people or not. All right. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question. It's something you haven't addressed up to now. As many people saw this crisis, both actually, though, actually all three, the pandemic the economic crisis and global climate crisis, that this would all be an opportunity you know, to change the paradigms, new policies, and it doesn't seem to be happening. You know, the Green Deal of the EU appears to be becoming more and more a brown deal. Mm -hmm. We see lots of lobbyists uh, trying to weaken actually the goals that have been set before the pandemic. You're at the source, you're in Brussels. What is happening on this front? Um, yeah, I mean, the, it, it's funny. I, yeah, I wouldn't have mentioned the, um, the climate crisis that much during the, um, during the talk, but in my head, it's kind of, uh, it goes without saying that it, it shapes everything that any um, any political uh, activists are doing at the moment. So the um, the the European Commission um, in it's in the president's uh, speech last week, the so-called State of the EU, the EU's attempt to um, to imitate the US. Uh, they announced that uh, uh, the the 2030 um, target for for uh, for reducing carbon emissions would be raised up to 55 percent, at least 55 percent. She kept emphasizing that. So that was a minor step forward, but it means um, it, it's already facing a lot of resistance. And the German auto industry is a huge player in this, and they've been lobbying very intensely. Um, European officials. We get emails every day from all of these lobbyists who are, um, you know, you need to, uh, you need to um, take the pandemic into consideration and understand that we're under so much pressure and we can't 
possibly comply with these demands. So there, they have really seized the opportunity to go on the offensive in terms of trying to water things down. You have the same thing with um, the financial institutions. They're saying we can't possibly be more regulated now because we face this. Um, we're you know we're all we're all in this together. Um, but already there, I mean, there had already been enormous uh, problems with the the EU's Green Deal. I mean, they very consciously didn't include the word new in, you know, Green New Deal, um, as had been demanded by activists because of the, the policy implications of uh, public works programs and, you know, actually repeating what was done um, in the US under the New Deal. So uh, it very much relies um, on the, the accounting trick, the leveraging trick that I was referring to um, where the you know the, the commission is talking about mobilizing a trillion euro for a green transition um, but actually they're only in, in reality they're they're talking about leveraging that um, that money from the from the private sector so the EU strategy is to use a small amount of public money as a guarantee to leverage private investment um, they don't have any you know, they don't have any uh, alternative if the private investment isn't forthcoming. They're just not willing to mobilize the money, the public money for a direct investment um, into the green transition. Um, the, the other aspect that they've announced recently is that 30% uh, of the bonds that are issued under the next generation will have to be, um, will be climate, bond, climate related bonds. But we've been um, going through a big battle, you know, all of the environmental NGOs and other people have been involved over the past year about what actually counts as green um, in terms of sustainable finance, what actually, what, what, what officially will the EU classify as being a green uh, institution or company. And we've had the most absurd debates where you have conservatives arguing that um, you can't possibly mention fossil fuels in the, in the definition. Uh, gas is perfectly fine. You know, so, so in all of the EU's um, legislation and uh, plans to date, gas is counted as a renewable energy. Um, so again, I think it's a lot of, a lot of talk. Uh, even, even before the pandemic, it's a lot of talk uh, and a lot of kind of, um, you know, nice words but the substance is really, really lacking. And now we're uh, in the situation where, um, yeah, we're already, we're already uh, you know, under pressure from, um, from industry and from polluters to, to rescue them and to, to allow them some leeway um, and to give them more time to adjust to the climate transition. All right, then one last question which we can maybe close this. After the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009, 2010, I think a lot of progressives said, we won't be fooled again. Are we being fooled again? Well, I think that, yeah, it's a, it's a good question also because you had this kind of um, you had this kind of uh, attitude after the you know uh, particularly among the left um, that neoliberalism was dead you know after the two thousand and eight crisis and you had the the state rescue of and state major intervention into into the economy um, but you know neoliberalism is is deeper. Um, and kind of all penetrating in terms of a, a right across society. Um, so state intervention doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that it's over. Uh, and now you have similar arguments being made again, um, that it, even by, you know, leaders of economic institutions that neoliberalism is dead. I think it's more resilient than that. And I think the question as always for the left is organization. So we've suffered a lot of defeats over decades um, and are in 
a relatively in a weak position organizationally, but you have this huge appetite, which you could you saw in the United States and Britain with the support for the Sanders and corporate campaigns, um, particularly young people who who they <laughs> they they might not know exactly what they want, but they know they don't want capitalism. Um, and again, it's just yeah, it's as always with the left, it's a, it's a matter of slowly uh, doing the painstaking work of actually building up our organizations, um, our level of organization and political education and activism and uh, trying, trying to actually respond to the, um, the institutional disadvantages that we have to doing that. So, you know, the decline of the trade union movement, the, um, the atomization of individuals, the decline of community organizations, we're all very, um, you know, we're all very separate. So we need to come up with new ways of, of organizing. And um, yeah, I don't have any uh, major brilliant new <laughs> answers to how, how do we do that. Um, but it is the only thing that will actually uh, give us the power to actually uh, neoliberalism die. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the the, the thing about the, um, the global financial crisis and the debate that happened in the years after it that shocked me and probably shocks you and, and others um, is that, yeah, people in the activist left or people on the left may, um, you know, have it very clearly in their mind, but the, the short memories of the general public um, was really ever People have, um, people have basically thought, well, you know, we've had a recovery, everything, everything is kind of going smoothly now, or a section of the population thought that. Um, so, I mean, this has had a much more personal impact on people. People have actually been affected, you know, obviously beyond, beyond unemployment. Um, they've had to wear masks, they've had to um, remain at home for, for months, work from home, uh, experience the containment measures. So this might really uh, change people's mindset more, more significantly than the global financial crisis did. But again, um, it's up to us about what we actually do with that consciousness. All right, thank you very, very much, Emma. When your paper is finished, let us know and we'll, um, we'll post that on Brave New Europe. For those of you who don't know it, it's, uh, it's our website. It's www.bravenewyoropeinoneword.com. Emma, by the way, also has an excellent blog. It's Emma Clancy, C-L-A-N-C-Y.com. Uh, but she's also participating in a, another brilliant, of course, unknown website, the Irish Broad Left. What is the, um, the address for that? Yeah, that's just irishbroadleft.com. Okay. We would also, once again, like to thank Helle Panke and the Luxembourg Foundations for their support in making these talks possible. And I hope to see you on the 6th of October, same time, same place. So thank you very much, Emma. And this will thank be so on YouTube in a, in a few days. Yep, that's great. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. All right. Bye. Bye.